Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Margot Kransny. And she's here today to share with us her new book, What Would I Do Without You? A Collection of Short Stories About Friendship. Now, how important are the relationships you have with your friends? Today, Margot's here to share with us inspiration on the power of friendship. Now, Margot is a former actress who never let her lung complications prevent her from taking center stage. She's become a business trailblazer and the founder of the radio department at Doyle Dane Bernatch Advertising, as well as founding her own public speaking coaching program, Speak Up. She subsequently authored the landmark public speaking book, Say It With Confidence. I'm so honored that we have Margot here with us today. She's such an inspiring lady. She spent most of 2020 in isolation due to being in the at-risk category for COVID. This year has reinforced her commitment to helping others, particularly older women, feel heard, and also feel connected to one another through the power of relationships. So let's welcome to the show, Margot Kransny. Well, thank you for having me on. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. I know you're such a great writer. I have to ask you, like, what inspired you to write this book now? It's interesting. First of all, friendships for me have been the mainstay of my life. And the thing is, as you age, and I have no problem letting your audience know that I am 83. And But as you age, you lose friends. There is nothing you can do about it. You either lose them from illness, death, moving away, disagreements. And you realize at a certain point how precious the ones you have are especially the long-term ones that you've been able to maintain uh, are to you. And so I was at a particular place that I had broken up with a friendship and I started looking at myself in one of those, what's wrong with you? How many people have you broken up with? You're a terrible person, all of that kind of thing. And it prompted a sto- one story, and which, by the way, is not in the book because I went on to then write another and then another, and that one didn't hold up as well. So that basically was the impetus for putting all these stories together. So as you were pulling these stories together, were there some that just didn't quite make the cut? Because oh, I yes. mean, these stories are great. Thank you. No, there's certainly some that did not make the cut. Uh, Some things I just had to get out of my system and then you throw it away. Uh, Others just sounded a little repetitious. Uh, So those left. And so I just kept ones that had different um, qualities to them so that there was some very, a lot of variation on the theme. So I know right now, a lot of people are feeling so isolated and silenced, and that's something that you really address. Why do you think it's more important to talk about that now than ever? Well, I would say in my case, I've always been, (laughs) I share too much. Uh, It was the bane of my mother's existence. Uh, I tend to share And I just find I'm better if I do. I don't know if the person who's listening to me is always better, but I am. So uh, I just think if you don't, you bottle it up and it just doesn't do anyone good. And when you're isolated, if you don't reach out and you don't share, and Lord knows this last year has been, for me, isolation. Uh, I I live alone. Um, I have my whole life. And but I've always been able to reach out. So if it weren't for Facebook, you know, FaceTime, I don't know how I would have made it through this last year because I've just, uh, that's been my way of communicating. But I just think keeping things inside 
and not reaching out and not finding out about someone else and not knowing that you are not alone is is mandatory through life, but certainly through a pandemic. I think your stories really kind of bring people back to what relationships are all about and what it means to be in a friendship. And I, I really love how you brought these all together. What is one that really stands out in your mind? Well, as any mother would say, I do not play favorites. I know. <laughs> Million dollar question, <laughs> I right? I do not play favorites. Uh, but on the subject of what we were just talking about, the um, Starlight Starbright stands out simply because Number one, it came out of something very real that happened. Uh, A moment in time with a friend I was losing to ALS. And after she was gone, I wrote the story. But it is not about her and it doesn't, and none of it is real. It's all made up. But the essence of it is there. And the friendship that was from a very young age all the way through the ups and downs of a friendship, the breaking up of a friendship, the coming back to the friendship. I think that's the one that that gives the longevity of it all. You know, I have to say that that story really resonated with me for several different reasons, but I think one right now is Everyone knows somebody that they've lost due to COVID. I mean, I have, I know a lot of my friends have. And so it really kind of puts, I think, in in perspective how important relationships are. Loss is incredible. And the, the older you get, you experience it. There's no getting away from it. You know, you're either the first to go or someone else's. I mean, that's the reality of life. And, and friendships take work. I I really think that most of us take it sort of for granted. We know nowadays that marriage takes work. We know that, you know, our work takes work, but I don't know if we really understand how much work a friendship does take and has to take to maintain it. So in your expert opinion, what do you uh-huh. say? <laughs> what would you say that really takes to maintain it? Because I think nowadays people, I mean, they're so used to doing friends in a different way. It's likes and, you know, kind of posts and not really friendships. And I think a lot of times people are missing that point of really developing those lasting friendships. Well, I know this is not what I'm supposed to say, but Social media, (laughs) I understand the need for it. I accept, on one hand, the need for it, but I find it totally frustrating texting to me if you're going to say, where are you? I'm over here on such and such street. That's fine. If you're saying a quick thing back and forth. But when it gets into a back and forth and back and forth, all I want to do is scream and say, can we talk? You know, um, I have, in all honesty, a problem with, with Facebook because I don't care what you had for breakfast. I do care how you're feeling, not to everybody, but to talk with me about yourself. So I just feel that that friendships have to be something on a deeper level than a text or a post. Isn't that terrible of me? No, you know, I agree as well, because a lot of that can be very superficial and getting to a place where we actually are having authentic relationships with people, I think is almost a lost art in many ways. And that's one of the reasons why I really appreciated your book, because I think it brings back home some of the things that maybe either some people have missed out or are missing. Well, you know, there's one very short, short story in the book, which is based on reality, uh, which is this friendship I've had for many years, which is basically a telephone friendship, but it is deeper than many other friendships I have had. 
because the time we have spent talking to each other continually through, I think it's 19, 20 years now, 21 years probably by now, uh, and goes on to this day, you know, talked to her this morning, you know, <laughs> and, and it's a very deep friendship. It certainly would never have been if it would have just been, I'll, I'll meet you for coffee and then a text that wouldn't have done it. I've seen her divorce. I've seen it through a remarriage. Of, you know, it can keep going on and on and on. So in your opinion, when we look at communication, where do you think the power of communication really resides in? Uh, I'm, I'm smiling because the, I happen to be, besides being an author, I happen to also be a communications coach. I've had a number of careers. Uh, the last one, by the way, started at the age of 50. So if anyone wants to, you know, know what you can do after 50, you can start a whole new life. So, so I'm a communications coach who despises PowerPoint. And the other day, someone said, if you do a PowerPoint presentation, you are without both, meaning you do not you do not make a point and you do not have any power. So when you just said this business about the power, that's where my mind just went. Uh, the, the powerfulness of getting to know someone and caring about them and being there for them is incredible. I couldn't, I couldn't be taking one foot in front of the other without it. Yeah. It's those, it's really those deep connections that really carry us through in life. And we learn so much from each other. At least I feel like, you know, like we do. And, and during this time, it seems that people either are feeling like they are um, learning and they're connected online, or they're feeling like they're completely isolated and not being seen or heard at all. You know, I, I, I hear about that. Uh, A friend of mine mentioned someone who is feeling that. I haven't experienced it because I am so used to reaching out. As a single woman, you find that if you don't reach out to other people who might be married, who might be in relationships, they are not going to be in need of you as much as you are in need of them. And so all my life I have known that if I wanted to have a friend, if I wanted to have a client, if I wanted to do anything, I had to be the one to reach out. And I couldn't wait for the phone to ring because there's no way it can. So it takes a lot of effort and you get a lot of rejections, but there's no other choice you have but to force yourself I mean, I'll give you a description. There's a there certain person I know that every time I call, she's busy. And I have kept calling. And eventually we get together and have a fun time. I don't call that regularly after the first, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. But you've got to do that. You have no choice if you, if you don't want to be isolated. You have to find someone to reach out to. There's ways to volunteer that you can even do that at home. So totally. the, yeah, and I think a lot of people don't even think about that. I'm doing it right now. I'm working pro bono um, for an organization and I'm doing it all via Zoom. You know, so it, it's, it's there. I have a, a, another friend who she's part of an organization since they can't get together anymore they, they are doing all sorts of things like having they're each baking something together while, with, over Zoom. You know, during the first months of the pandemic, I was cooking my dinner while friends were cooking theirs. I was sitting in my, by my desk watching them do other things. And it just felt like you were spending an afternoon together. 
So there are ways of doing it. It's just that you can't wait for someone else to instigate it if you are feeling lonely. You just can't. Yeah. Well, you know, someone has to take the first step and move forward. And I mean, I know um, you also talk about like the psychological and emotional importance of keeping friends during this time. I'd love for you to share your thoughts about that with our listeners. Okay. Um, I can get very depressed. I don't mean clinical depression, but certainly during this particular year, the year before I lost my niece and I lost one of my closest friends, the gal that the Starlight Stop Right was based on. And I was not out of mourning at the point that COVID hit. So I had just sort of, you know, 2019 had been hell on earth. And I was hoping 2020 would be (laughs) a little bit better, but I was still crying every day. There was, you know, it was very difficult. And while I, you know, was working, which I was, it was emotionally very difficult, very hard. And then COVID hit. And so for the first month or two, you know, we were all like everybody else. I'm, you know, washing everything down. I remember washing grapes at one point with soap and water. Um, You know, so I was busy, you know, and listening every two minutes to the television and what was happening. And there was all this, it was very frenetic. And then as things slightly calmed, and this was a, a, a different kind of calm. And, you know, I, I'm asthmatic. I have COPD. And so the fear of what could come was engulfing. And the only way I found that I could maintain s- sanity was to call a dear friend and say how I was feeling. To, to get it out so that I could have something soothing come back. And then finding maybe they were in the same place, which took me away from myself. And then I became the soother. But it was the only thing that got me through this year. I can understand that. I mean, I think a lot of people feel that same way just for the tremendous amount of loss that we've all gone through, you know, in one form or another, it could be, you know, someone losing a job or their home or, you know, a a loved one. And so it's just been a year of loss. And, Mm -hmm. um, and the only way one gets through that number one is just to know that time does play an important part in this. You know, I realized this morning out of nowhere that, I haven't cried in at least a week (laughs) or two, not even a two. And I'm going, wow, that's new. Uh, I have taken walks. I'm very grateful every time I see everyone masking up uh, because originally no one was. So it allows me to get out a little bit more. And I've had my shots, which hallelujah. Um, but it, we're still living in a, in a very precarious time because we are not through this. This is not over. And it won't fully be over for quite a while. And it can get emotionally even more difficult because everything we do now is a decision that we make. Is this okay to do? Is it not okay to do? You know, the first few months of the pandemic, decisions were made for us. You can't. (laughs) Don't. You know, you may not. Um, But now you may, you may not. It gets a little bit more. We're right at the precipice. We feel, oh, my God, we're almost there. So it feels a little bit more um, hopeful, but at the same time, a little bit more dangerous. So this is a very difficult time right now. Different, but difficult. And you need people around you. God, I can't say it enough. 
even if it's just someone behind a counter who is, you know, giving you your change and you just say to that person, thank you. I just, you need human contact right now, one way or another. You know, going back to your book, you have a chapter called After 30 Years that I think when people read this would find it to be a little bit comical. <laughs> You're going through it going, okay. I started to laugh the minute you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, it really, I mean, I think that's how really sometimes friendship goes, you know? It's like, okay, we are just lay it all out there, you know? Oh, my God. Um, I had more fun writing that. I can imagine. <laughs> I had such fun writing that. You know, I mean, to this day, you mention it and I start giggling. Um, it was, there's a bit of truth in there, but um, I, I'm not free to divulge what is and what isn't. But the, the fun of writing that um, dissolution of a friendship it still puts a big smile on my face. I'm, I'm grinning right now at the mention of that one. <laughs> well, why don't you share a little bit about that for our listeners? Because, I mean, I I just think it's hysterical, especially when we get to the part about the fish. <laughs> um, oh, dear. Well, let me just say what the story. It's about an email exchange. So the whole story is written as if it's emails going back and forth. And this is a a friendship that's over 30 years old, which comes to a head over a lunch. And the um, one friend says in the original, you know, about she doesn't understand why the other is so upset. And that sets it off. And it goes back to every little thing that you could possibly, which is what happens when we fight terribly. Um, we pick every tiny little meat off the bone <laughs> or fish off the bone in this case. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the best way I can describe it. I don't want to spoil the the fun of it for you. Rita, oh, no. Because yeah. it, it's, it is, it, it is fun. <laughs> It is fun. And I also think it brings into importance the, you know, just how important communication is because you could see things come to a head. It's like, okay, if we have communication, maybe some of, I mean, while it's very comical and it's, I, I, I couldn't stop laughing reading it. I, I think that, you know, when we look at everything coming to a head, it's like, hey, if we're able to communicate better, then maybe it, it resolves some of those issues. Well, I'm not sure that particular story could ever be resolved. (laughs) (laughs) You're probably right. (laughs) I really don't think it could really be resolved. Uh, I just hope your readers have, you know, your listeners have great fun reading it if they get the book, because it is, it is a laugh out loud. Happily. Since oh, a yes. lot of the stories are not laugh out loud, yeah, comic relief. It, <laughs> well, you know, and it's we need to have some relief. You know, we all need to have some kind of relief, especially right now. And did you find that you know writing kind of helped cope with what's going on now with the COVID nineteen and everything going on? What helped me with the writing of the book was the editing of the book. Uh, I'm more of an editor than a writer. I spend more time rewriting than I do writing. And so for many months from, from, well, I started in January, but let's say from March, 2020 through November, most everything was editing the book and it kept my mind occupied and, um, focused away from current events here and there. The um, writing that I did, original writing, not, not editing, through the, um, those months, all had to do with where I was at particular times during COVID. 
from the very first piece I wrote, which talked about not, um, this is not in the book, these were just essays, some of which had been uh, put up online. Uh, but they would, they dealt with where I was from thinking I was not going to live to the next year with COPD and the original fears about COVID to where I started to reevaluate everything in terms of COVID. And it just kept going. So those were the pieces that helped me through. Um, and the editing of the the stories helped me um, help me with my keeping my mind focused on something other than COVID. You know, it's rare to hear that. I was so impressed that, you know, the editing kind of really had you focusing on that. And I think for our listeners who are writers, you know, perhaps focusing on their writing and editing is, is a way to get through whatever is happening during this time, because it seems like everything is kind of trying to draw our attention to all this negativity. You can't, you can't edit and be someplace else. You really have to be line by line, word by word into what you're doing. So the focus, I find editing the most calming part of everything. I find writing wrenching (laughs) at times, unless, of course, it's a humorous piece. Um, But that can be wrenching. The, The editing of it gives me a focus that, you know, I... I've I've written a mem- memoir, and that I wrote three times from scratch until I got it right. Uh, I just think editing is is the most important part of writing. I, I I'm not someone who can just write and leave it. You know, I just don't know how anyone does that. Well, you do such a brilliant job. It's written so well, and I love how it all comes together. What do you want our listeners to take away from your book? Oh, find ways to keep your friends close. (laughs) Loss is terrible. Find a way. I mean, there are friends in the book that I don't have anymore. Some because I did something wrong, something because they did something wrong. Sometimes just because I lost them. Um, but work at the friendship. Don't let it just go away. Just work at it. You know, friendship is work. You know, you can't just let it sit there and expect for it to continue to grow like any you know, if we, we have a garden, we have to water it and tend it. And you, you know, you also have to go back. You know, in the first story, which is of a friendship that ends, a very short story, there were a number of attempts to keep it going. And then, yes, there is a point where you have to let it go. But you don't let it go until you've really tried and tried and tried to keep it. (laughs) Well, I think that's a good way to live life and to look at how to approach friendship. Your book was just fabulous. I absolutely love What Would I Do Without You? Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your other books as well? Well, I am redoing the website. Um, the uh, as of, of I did the website over a few years ago, and everyone hates it. So I said, "Okay, I will redo it." So we're right. So in about two weeks, we will have a new website up. It'll be Margo M A R G O T Speakup dot com, and. The books can be got, all the books are available on Amazon, Uh, but you can get the, uh, you can go on the website, there'll be articles there, and we are going to put up a link so that there can be communication back and forth, which is not on the old website, or soon to be old website. But the books are all on Amazon, and uh, it's under margotspeakup.com. And the last name is Krasny, K-R-A-S-N-E. 
and I'd love to hear from you. Well, Margo, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Marianne, thank you so much. I love being part of this. Well, thank you, Margo. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, What Would I Do Without You? What Would I Do Without You is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. And of course, it's available on Kindle. Again, if you'd like to connect with Margo, you can at margotspeaksup.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.